So this week's uh, video assignment's a little different. You get to actually respond to somebody in, your, in the class, um, which I think is super healthy again. It's very important you guys, uh, hopefully, I hope some of, some of you can meet some people in this class and make some friends. So that's one of the reasons I'm trying to do this uh, coffee thing every Thursday. You know, the first time I taught this class, uh, the only complaints I really got that was, that was reasonable was, uh, other than I don't like my grade, was that uh, I didn't get to interact with my fellow students too much. And so, you know, it is a lecture course with an online lab, so that's, that makes things tricky. But come on out on Thursday mornings and hang out, and I, I want to get to know you guys too better. And that's kind of the best way to do it, and you can meet each other. Enough said about that. All right, did anybody think about that uh, bear story in the sky after uh, Tuesday? Anybody come up with a, uh, an interpretation of it other than mine? Yeah. All right, keep thinking about it. I'm going to keep pestering you about this. Mm. And I thought that was a different parallel because all the natives always refer to they don't call them bears, they call them grandfather. Interesting. Of the woods. Yeah. And I, I thought that was interesting. That is interesting. All right, so, the, so uh, Dusty, right? Yeah. Mentions that the in indigenous traditions in North America treat the bear as a masculine entity and the uh, Europeans treat it as a female entity, which is, is quite interesting. And actually, that brings up something I wanted to talk about because, you know, I have to be really careful uh, in, in telling some of these stories because, you know, last time we talked a little bit about how the early Hellenized traditions, the Minoans, were this more matriarchal society, and it sort of started leaning towards this more patriarchal society by the time of the Romans. And we've inherited, of course, a lot of the Roman traditions and stuff, and, and I want to be... I want to be careful to balance these perspectives because this is obviously not the, the way that all peoples have, have seen this. And as, as you bring up, the, the Native American tradition uh, actually was obsessed with balance and, and, among other things, balance between the genders and between uh, these two. Actually, let, I'm going to read you a little piece of this because uh, we didn't really get to it last time and I wanted to, to read it to you last time. But, the way that the, uh, this is the Navajo tradition, the way that they see the Big Dippers is actually quite instrumental in understanding this worldview, which is in some sense uh, less concerned with the stratification and hierarchical organization of societies as uh, in the Western tradition. Now, that hierarchy, that hierarchy is by definition tyrannical in some sense, but it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing wholesale, which is a difficult set of concepts to wrestle with, you know. Uh, we were talking earlier uh, about middle school and like being confronted with social hierarchies for the first time and how terrifying that actually is and how we each have to go through it. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of reasons why that, that is set up and I think that the reason that we don't see as much of that in these indigenous communities is because social hierarchies become really important when you need to organize hundreds and hundreds of people, right, as they did in the West in these giant metropoli and these empires, right? Um, it's very difficult to, to sort through one by one and get to know people. Um, I think there's, there's actually a number for this. I, th I think that the scientists call it, I think it's the Dunbar number, but it's something like you can only really sustain a certain number, and it's a rather small number, I, I think less than 100 or maybe around there, of personal relationships in your lives. You can't really get to know more than 100 people at any one given time. And so that makes sense when you're living in, in a tribal community or a village or something like that. But when you start to spread out, that's when you start to see, or sorry, when you start to concentrate a lot of people together, it's when you start to see the, the production of states and these uh, really hierarchical societies. So anyways, the, the stories that, that people tell about the sky and are going to reflect that, and, and the indigenous people have a very different take on that same asterism, the same bears in the sky. Uh, the Navajo people call them the revolvers. And, and so I want to read you this little piece. Unfortunately, well, maybe some of you are sick of this mythology stuff. This is kind of the last point for a little while that we'll get to deal with it because uh, we need to move into some actual physics today and talk about um, the actual processes that are, are guiding the motion of these bodies and, and get into the details of that a bit more. So 
Let me just put a pin in it with this, this last uh, excerpt from this book. Again, buy this book if, if you like this stuff. It's called Native Science. It's by Gregory Cajete, and uh, he, he's a member of the Navajo community. All right, so the Big Dipper and Little, Little Dipper, they, they call them the male and female revolvers. Okay, so there you have it. And then the pole star itself is called the central fire. So in Western astronomical view, the Big Dipper, Ursa Major, Big Bear, is complemented by the Little Dipper, Little Bear. The Navajo do not see dippers, but rather the male and female revolvers. The male revolver's body consists of seven stars, and two stars represent the warrior's feathers. The female revolver's bodies also consist of seven stars. So there's a balance there that they see, right? They each consist of seven stars. The male and female revolvers are viewed as a paired constellation rather than separate. The male revolver lies next to the fire between him and the female revolver. The first central fire, the central fire, is known in Western culture as Polaris, or the North Star. Four stars surrounding the fire guarded by the revolvers extend to the four cardinal directions. To the Navajo, the fire is sacred and represents home, and a strong fire means a strong home life. The revolver, revolver pair serve as guides to other constellations as well as the people of Earth. Their cycles measure the seasons, and they appear in the sky at different locations depending on the season. Thus, the revolvers rotate clockwise around the fire, while the Earth rotates counterclockwise. The revolvers help the people identify the seasons and the time of night. For instance, when dawn approaches, the male revolver is standing. People are expected to rise at dawn, face the east, make their offerings, and begin their daily activities. In the protection way ceremonies, the male revolver is key to helping restore balance and harmony to the lives of the family. The disharmonious elements that have infiltrated the family are cast far away past the revolvers in the fire. The revolvers are there to protect the family from the dangers that might try to return to them. So I think this is a really interesting, uh, and in some sense, a, a more grounded perspective on, on the way that we should, in some sense, ideally organize our communities, right? Because we, uh, we be, we've become very obsessed with the hierarchical and, st and stratified organization of our own lives too, right? You're, you're all trying to, you're here in college in some sense because yeah, you want to learn some stuff, fair enough. Maybe you want to meet new people, but ultimately you're trying to get that piece of paper so that you can move up in your career or, or get a job, which is a bit different than having a career. And, and you want to hopefully get a better job after that. And so there, there is this ladder that, that we're all climbing in the West to some extent and, and no one's really uh, excused from it. However, among those, that, that ladder climbing business, which we're all deeply fixated on here in the university and so forth, there's also this idea that you need to have a good life while you're doing it, right? And this, this is actually a much more difficult problem to solve. And it's a, it's a, it's a type of intelligence that doesn't pan out on standardized tests and so forth. So there's this scholar at Columbia um, named Adam Mastroianni, and he wrote this really interesting essay where he, he talks about two types of intelligences. And the type of intelligence that we measure with IQ tests and so forth is something like the known problem intelligence. In other words, if I give you a kind of problem like a math problem, you've seen math problems before. In fact, this math problem I'm going to give you has a solution to it, right? There's a standard solution that I can actually tell you the answer to, all right? We're really good at selecting for and perpetuating that kind of intelligence. But it turns out that there's a completely other type of intelligence, which is the unknown problem intelligence. And the unknown problem intelligence is something like how do I make myself happy in this life that ultimately ends in the death of myself and everybody I know? Like, how do I have a good day today, right? That's, that doesn't have a solution to it. No one can tell you the answer to that. In fact, nobody can really even help you with that other than to say how maybe they did it and you can listen to their stories and maybe you find some resonance with their stories and maybe you don't. But there's something that these tribal communities understood and worshipped and organized themselves around, which involved harmony, which involved 
that process of talking to people and resonating with different aspects of their experience and learning from those and putting those into your own world. And this kind of mental exercise is something that doesn't get enough play. Uh, maybe, maybe if you've been on an athletic team or you were in a band or something like that, you, you get a sense of this, uh, this tribal intelligence that's extraordinarily valuable. And, and like we were talking about before class, I think that uh, everything that you guys are doing right now, yeah, it's difficult, you have exams, you have deadlines, but it's pretty manageable. But what you find is when you get out into the real world, the hardest task is actually integrating yourself into these communities and making yourself useful and getting along with, with the jerk at the office or whatever it is. These are, these are the really, really hard parts about life. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that today and in this class in general, and in life in general, there's something really to be meditating on regarding the concept of balance. So today we're going to talk about the different forces that propel these, these objects in our, in our solar system. And we're going to talk about how the balance is essentially where all of our mathematics point. So when we're trying to calculate the orbits of these bodies, we're talking about the opposing forces of them being pulled toward the sun and them flying away from the sun, which is perfectly balanced on our own planet right now. You know, if we were going just a little bit faster on, uh, in our orbit, we would leave the orbit, right? And maybe this will happen at some point. Or if we were going a little bit slower, we would just fall straight into the sun. And, and everything is like this, right? So we're going to keep coming back to that concept. And I think it's really important one to hang on to uh, and keep in mind as we move forward. All right, so most of the class today, uh, we're going to be talking about how people came to, A, understand that we're standing on this rock in the first place, which is actually something people figured out a couple thousand years ago, which is actually pretty remarkable, maybe much longer. Uh, but we'll talk about the Western tradition of how the Earth was first measured. And people actually figured out the size of the Earth long before they were able to go up into space with uh, satellites and so forth. And that's a pretty cool story. Then we're going to talk about uh, how they figured out that essentially the Earth was not at the center of the universe and exactly what it was that these planets were doing. You know, as we understand it now, they're orbiting the sun. And uh, that was not an easy thing to figure out. And then furthermore, to figure out the precise pattern by which they orbit the sun was not easy either because, well, People really, really were obsessed with the circle, and I'll show you why they were obsessed with the circle. But it turns out the planets don't orbit the sun in a circle, and that was mind-blowing to the people who were studying these things a few thousand years ago because they couldn't understand why in the world, well, they didn't even go there. They just assumed that, of course, if they're orbiting the sun, they must be orbiting in some sort of circles, right? Because circles are the perfect object, and we'll, we'll look at why they thought circles were the perfect object primarily because they allow for the calculation of extraordinarily mysterious things like the size of the Earth, which we'll get to in a second. So the laws of planetary motion uh, were derived with no paucity of pain and suffering and, and argumentation and, you know, uh, people died. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then we'll, we'll get around to Newton, too, because he kind of cleaned up the, the situation at the end of the day, which is funny because uh, the, the principal laws that we use to describe planetary motion at this point are Newton's laws, for the most part. We have Einstein's relativism. We're not going to play with that too much in this course, but needless to say, when NASA sends a rocket, say, to the moon, they're not using Einstein's formulation of gravity. They're using Newton's. So the story was essentially finished in, in the 1600s, 1700s. Say right around the turn of that century. Okay. So, you guys have any flat earther friends? Any of you flat earthers? Does Sam Regal count? I don't know who that is. <laughs> Should I? Is he, a, is he a big YouTuber or something? Okay. No. So, so, you know, it seems, of course, flat earthers are the butt of, of numerous jokes at this point. But it brings up a really, really interesting point, is that from a very relativistic standpoint, a good argument can be made that the Earth is, in fact, flat. Now, 
I spent a, a fair amount of time kicking at, at the preeminence of mathematics in science the last two lectures. And so I want to make up for that a little bit today because I do think that mathematics can help us narrow down some really bad ideas. And, and in some sense, it can point us towards really good ideas. Uh, the only thing that we have to really wrestle with, and, and I am wrestling with it too, is that mathematics doesn't seem to be sufficient for an explanation. So what we're going to find is that, yes, we can send these rockets to the moon. We have these we have this understanding that the planets are attracted to one another, but we still haven't figured out what it is that holds them to one another. And, you know, there's an argument to be made from a relativistic standpoint that, you know, especially the pop sci media has done a great job of reifying this concept of space-time, right, which is an idea, and making it seem like it's a fabric, right, and so maybe then you have some, idea, some sort of mechanistic understanding of how gravity works. But the fact of the matter is that ideas like space-time don't actually bend like a rod of metal, okay? So it's not really a fabric, and it's, it's really just a very poetic and, and beautiful way of looking at things. That's not to say that it's not extraordinarily accurate in a quantitative fashion. And so, we're gonna, I'm going to be really wrestling with this. You know, a lot of times when I come here to talk to you guys, I have a problem, and I'm going to try to work it out over the course of this talk, and I'm going to try to work it out over the course of this entire class. And so this is something that we're going to keep wrestling with because there's extraordinary value in math, and it can also lead us down in ter like these terrible rabbit holes that last into thousand-year dark ages where we, we, the math works perfectly, as we'll see with the, uh, excuse me, with the geocentric... Uh, universe. The math was perfect, but it's absolutely wrong, is the thing. So we have to be careful with mathematics. It, it can be illuminating at once, and it can also be absolutely deceptive. So we'll keep uh, wrestling with that as we go forth. All right. Well, I'll tell you this story. There's this guy. He's a uh, First millennium BC, he's, a, he's in uh, Hellenized Egypt. A lot of these astronomers, by the way, are these Greeks in Egypt, which is a little perplexing, but you have to understand that the Greeks at some point uh, culturally conquered Egypt, let's say. And uh, so they set up this, uh, there was a huge, one of the first real universities was there in Egypt, the, this Alexandria place. They had a famed library that contained all the world's knowledge, including a uh, some incredible star catalogs and so forth. So there's this gentleman. His name's uh, Aristophanes. And he was working there. And he was working on this problem because there had been some intimations uh, in the old world that perhaps the Earth wasn't flat, which was somewhat heretical at the time. And, um, you know, there is, again, it's very difficult for me to bring the astronomy of the, of the Far East into this picture because, A, there's a language barrier, but there's also a lot of impediments to the archaeology and so forth. But maybe the Indians and the Indus Valley civilization understood this long before the Greeks. And the reason that I think that might be true is because the ancient Indian word for Earth is something like ball of mud, right? So they seem to have perhaps in their language understood this uh, better than the, the ancient uh, West. But at any rate... The popular idea of the day was that the Earth was flat. But this guy thought that that wasn't reasonable. And, you know, they were doing a lot of surveying at the time. And he, he noticed that, uh, this is how the fable goes anyways, you know, who knows if this is true. But he noticed there was a well in this one town. And at some point, the, the sun would be directly overhead and he could see the bottom of the well. Now, they had primitive timekeeping devices at the, at, back in that day, um, but they were quite accurate. So they had something like hourglasses. They had these water clocks, which, which were essentially hourglasses made of water. So they could keep time. They knew what time of day it was, more or less. And he realized that at the same time of day, back in Alexandria, there was actually a, a similar well, but you couldn't see the bottom of it. And he thought that was rather peculiar. And, and he thought that he could use this to test, actually, uh, the... Uh, the, the postulate that perhaps the Earth was round, and if it was round, he, uh, being a geometri geometrician, he was a geometer, realized that he could use that information to, say, figure out how big the Earth was. So the way he did this is kind of cool, and I, I drew a little picture. I hope you guys can see. Um, the idea was that, 
look, the sun is extraordinarily far away, much further away than this. And this is, say, the surface of the Earth right here. So the sun is so far away, he reasoned, that all of its rays are essentially parallel. So you can kind of imagine this, that if you have two lines, like a very acute angle, right? It's very, very, very shallow angle. That as, it gets, as you get further and further away down the hypotenuses of that triangle, those, those angles appear to be almost side by side, right? So he figured that the sun's rays we could essentially approximate as being parallel, which is, seems, it turns out to be a fairly reasonable uh, assumption. But if that were so, then you would have these two sticks, and you put them miles and miles apart, well, then it, it shouldn't really matter. If, as long as the world's flat, then you wouldn't really have different shadows at each one, right? You'd have no shadow, let's say, when the sun's overhead at both places. But he kind of knew this wasn't the case. So he set up this experiment to test it. What he did was he actually put one measuring rod over here where there was, say, no shadow. And then back in Alexandria, he was able to measure a small shadow here. And from that triangle, he was able to calculate the angle of that shadow from the pole. And he reasoned by this very, very basic law you guys probably learned in middle school, that if you set up this nice little system of these two parallel lines, and you trace this angle all the way back to the center of the Earth, that the opposite angles here should be equivalent to each other, right? Parallel lines, the opposite interior angles are equal. You probably learned this in, in geometry in like eighth grade or something. But this was brand new, you know, mathematics to these people at the time. They, they, this was really exciting. And so, you know, quite, quite simply, he was able to deduce the distance between, uh, well, they, they knew the distance between those two towns. And knowing the angle, which I think was about seven degrees, which is something like a 50th of the entire 360 degrees of the Earth, he was able to multiply that out by 50 and calculate the circumference of the Earth. And he actually did it really well. It, it was, uh, by, by many estimates, it was dead on. So, this is a really cool victory uh, of mathematics and reason. And it, it held great sway in that culture. And, and almost, I want to say almost overnight, people were on board with the idea that the Earth was actually round. It was actually a rock, and we were all standing on this rock, which was hurtling through space. So, this is, this is in some sense a, a quintessential, a, an archetypical victory for mathematics and for reason. Now, we'll see, again, many times throughout this course how, how mathematics has led us astray. And actually, the next story we're going to tell is one like that. But remember, the victory of Aristophanes and his opposite interior angles. How did he read them in different places? How close were they? Yeah, that, so, OK, this is the tricky. Yeah, the question is, how, how was he able to uh, gauge the distance between them or something like that? How was he able to monitor them? So he had a friend over there. Okay, that's yeah, right. so they said, they like, they would take two clocks that were the same, right? right? And they would each fill up their hourglass, like huge hourglass. I imagine huge hourglasses. I don't think anyone really knows what they did. <laughs> and, you know, they said, okay, when the hourglass reaches this point, I want you to measure uh, the length of the shadow and the angle between the, the shadow and the top of the pole, essentially. Okay. Right? And, you know, a bit and, and the tricky part in sort of evaluating how accurate he was is that we, they weren't using miles or kilometers back then. They used these things called stadia. And nobody really knows how long a stadia is, but they knew how long it was, right? And so in their own, and there's ways people have tried to, to it's, people have tried to figure out how many kilometers a stadia is, but it's not so simple. But yeah, he had a friend. That's the answer to the question. <laughs> he, had a, he had a helper. <laughs> so, and this is just a, a bit of his, I already drew this out for you, so we'll skip that. Now, the Greeks immediately upon realizing this, uh, they, the immediate conclusion was, oh, cool. So actually, the stars are all going around us. And, uh, and the sun's going around us, too, right? Which is a totally reasonable conclusion. Um, and they, ha they actually had good reason for thinking this, too. It's not just uh, that they, it's not, it's not as simple as maybe the textbook or 
or, or as history would have you believe that they just wanted to be at the center of the universe. It's not quite that simple. So th there's one troubling fact about all of this, which is the concept of parallax. And, and you might have experienced parallax before. It's like if you hold your finger out in front of you right now and you look at it and then you close one of your eyes and then, close, then alternate and close the other eye, you'll see that your finger moves right and left a little bit. Actually, if you move it closer, it does it even more. Okay? So there's a re the reason for this is because you're looking at it from two different places on your head, right? And so the ancients reasoned that, okay, look, the Earth were moving around the sun. Let's they said, let's, let's entertain this possibility. If that were so, then when we're on one side of the sun during the year, the stars should be in a slightly different place than if we were on the other side of its orbit. And they aren't. And that's, that's a, that's a real, that was a real puzzle for thousands of years, actually. Um, actually, it, it, there is some parallax that one can measure with very good telescopes at this point, and, and there was some evidence of this when Galileo uh, first started using the telescope for astronomy. But it wasn't, it wasn't so obvious, right? And, and it actually, this was not, it was not so easily measured that Galileo was able to use that as an argument for the Earth not being at the center of the universe. So this was a really strong argument, actually. There was no observable parallax among the stars during the different seasons of our orbit. Now, we know now that that, that turns out to be because those stars actually are so freaking far away that it's almost like this parallel angle, this parallel lines business from the sun. They're so, so far away that the parallax is just minuscule, right? In other words, the distance between, if you, like I said, if you take your finger and you move it really far away, that parallax starts to disappear, actually. And when, and you know, when you get, when I start looking at something out the back of the room, I can close one eye and the other and it essentially doesn't move. And that's what's going on. But there was no way for them to know this at the time. So, And actually, the, the king of all of the scholars at the time was this dude named Aristotle. You may have come across him in your other classes. And, and he really championed this argument that the parallax absolutely outlawed the possibility that what, that's what we could, uh, that we could be looking at a solar system with anything but the Earth at the center. Now, there were some other arguments uh, which were interesting, too, uh, that, that no one could deal with, such as the moon and the phases of the moon, right? Uh, in other words, people noticed that there was a crescent shape appearing, and were there to be crescents that appeared on some of the other planets as well, well, perhaps that would mean that they were moving as well, right? There was also some of the navigators would report that the stars would change position as they moved up and down the globe, right? All these things were a bit troubling. Now, also, yeah, so this was actually, this actually troubled people for close to, well, let's say, like 1,500 years or so. Now the the uh, Arabic scholars in early Islam made some headway on this, and it seems like they had a bit of a, a clearer picture. Uh, but again, nothing was conclusively established in, in terms of the world of astronomy at the time. All right. Now, there was a gentleman about 210 BC who proposed uh, and fought, argued very hard using some of these points that the, the Earth was not at the center. It's this guy, Aristarchus of Samos. But nobody was buying it. Now, we talked about Ptolemy last time. So Ptolemy was another one of these Egyptian Greeks. And Ptolemy kind of did a, he did a lot of wonderful things, first of all. So Ptolemy made one of the, the earliest in, uh, and most detailed maps of the known world at the time, which was actually pretty accurate, considering that they didn't have any sort of satellites or airplanes or anything to see with. Um, he also compiled one of the greatest star catalogs of the known world at the time. But Ptolemy did a, a huge, great disservice because he was an extraordinarily powerful mathematician and he had developed essentially this idea that flew in the face of people who were arguing against 
the geocentric worldview, which is that which is these wandering planets, right? And we talked about these a bit before class. So there's this bizarre thing that happens when, say, we're looking at Mars in the sky, which is that actually since we're a little bit inside the track compared to Mars, we can overtake it, right? I don't know if you, any of you guys have ever run races on a track, but it's always a preferable position to be on the inside of the track, right? Because you have less distance to cover, so you, you can speed by the people on the outer, outside. And that's essentially what's actually happening with the Earth, is that we, we overtake Mars in our, in, its, in our orbits at some point. And the, the perception is that Mars appears to move backwards. Okay, so this is a really good argument for... Uh, heliocentrism, right? That the planets are all orbiting some central point, which turns out to be our sun. But this gentleman concocted a very brilliant way of explaining this away and keeping the Earth patently at the center of the universe. And he did it using the circle, which was even more, you know, convincing. Because all of these geometric identities which we talked about earlier in terms of measuring the Earth, and, and there's many, many more that allowed people to navigate, especially, were based on the magnificent circle and the ability to cut the circle up and do incredible acts of mathematics with it to make measurements and calculations and predictions. And so what Ptolemy had done was he started adding little circles onto the orbits of, these of, the, of the wandering planets. So let's take a look at that. So, well, what it turns out is if he added a little orbit onto Mars, he could actually account for this backwards motion all of a sudden. He called these, uh, he called these extra orbits epicycles. Now, epicycle is a really, really important and fascinating concept. And, and I fear that we're struggling with a number of them still today because this seems to be a, an archetypical mistake that we're capable of making when we, make, when, when we follow our logic to, to its you know, end conclusions, right? Because ultimately, in order for Ptolemy to explain the solar system, he had to concoct a lot of these epicycles. Sometimes you'd have to have a wheel inside of a wheel inside of a wheel. But the fact of the matter is that you can take the heliocentric, right, the one, the, the, the solar system that we understand today, and you can absolutely deconvolve it into a series of epicycles that will be extraordinarily predictive. And without boring you with the details of this, this is actually sort of how it works. Uh, this, this is how, how a lot of audio manipulation works as well, in that you, you can actually divide up something simple like a sine wave, right? And of course, the sine wave comes from the rotation of the circle. You can divide that into smaller and smaller waves, and you can actually get all of the detailed information based on just simple sine waves, right? So you can do the same thing with a system like our solar system. You can divide it into smaller and smaller bits, and you can come up with a really accurate and predictive model. And that's what Ptolemy did, and it was so compelling. And the fact that he was able to use the circle to do it was very beautiful. And beauty has always been prized in science and mathematics, right? Some beauty which is perhaps a dangerous, uh, a dangerous obsession, uh, especially when beauty is synonymous with symmetry and so forth, because what you actually find if, you ever take a, if you've ever gone for a walk in the forest is that nature is not quite symmetrical, right? Trees are, the trees do have some symmetry at, at, at like a, a distance, but when you get up close, they're actually quite complex. In fact, I would say they're irreducibly complex. Right? You can draw me, uh, you cannot draw me a tree. You can only draw me, sorry, you cannot draw me tree. You can only draw me a tree, right? Each tree is very different from the next. And so I think nature is actually not very symmetrical and, and ultimately and not, you know, in that sense, beautiful. It's very complex and gnarled sometimes. And so chasing this idea of beauty, which is still a very big fascination in physics to this day, it is perhaps something we should be cautious of. What's up? Yeah, yeah, the wandering stars. Um, they're pulling on the sun, and the sun's pushing back. Make a, but why do they all seem to travel in the same ring? Why aren't they just, why aren't they different? Okay, uh, can you, are you talking about the, the old uh, ancient yeah. idea? or the Why is that? Are they working off of each 
other as well? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so that keeps them kind of on the same. That's rate. part of it, yeah. So we touched on this. I mean, the question is, um, why are the planets essentially in a ring together? And do they interact with each other? And is that important? And the truth is, yeah, it's very important. Actually, they're, the planets are in these beautiful resonances with one another. So what is a resonance? It means that every time a planet goes around, you know, and there's different patterns of this, but say a planet that has an octave resonance, we use the same terms in music, so a one-to-one -one resonance. That would mean that every time one planet goes around, another planet goes around. Now, you could be a one-to-two one to resonance, right, which would be like every time one planet goes around, the other one goes around twice, and they give each other a little kick each time, and it stabilizes the orbits, actually. And so the fact that they have this regular kick, it actually, it actually balances things out in this really beautiful way. And it's a very naturally occurring phenomenon, which is very strange. In fact, all of the stable solar systems that we can see have these resonances in them. And they're very musical. And actually, the, the early rationalists, the early Enlightenment thinkers were obsessed with this idea. They called it the music of the spheres, because you can actually see the tones of the musical scale in the solar system, which is just mind-boggling. I don't know if we'll... I think we get to this a little bit later in the course, um, but I'll have some examples of that for you. But, you know, you can see a perfect fifth, and I, I can't tell you off the top of my head who it is, but each of the planets relate to each other with these perfect resonances in terms of their orbital dynamics. So there is some important aspect of that. In terms of why they're in a plane, that's a, that's a very complex issue, and I think people, I think that, um, I think there's a lot of work going on uh, concerning that right now, but... Gravity, gravitational stability, resonance plays into it, certainly. So, you know, this, you, you see the two worldviews compared here. And uh, the one on the right here is the one that Ptolemy was arguing for. And, you know, there's, there's an argument to be made that, that in some sense it's more beautiful, especially if you look at the way that it traces out and you get these very beautiful floral patterns that, that appear as the, the orbits actually process uh, about the Earth. And I don't think these were just like barbaric idiots. Uh, I think that, uh, again, I think it's really important for you to, to imagine a student sitting in this classroom a thousand years from now. Uh, I, I imagine there's many things that we're going to talk about as established ideas today that will seem completely and utterly silly a thousand years from now. Uh, and I can't tell you exactly what those are, but I can tell you that any time you see the word black or dark or something like that in astronomy, it almost certainly means something that we don't understand yet. And so it's very, very easy to treat those like uh, they're done deals, uh, especially if you read the news, you read popular headlines, you're going to see things about dark energy and dark matter and black holes and stuff. And, and it seems like they're like understood phenomena to some extent. You know, Maybe there's some mysterious aspects about them. But I, I think the truth is a bit more like this. It's a bit more like this. It's a bit more like uh, these are complete and utter disasters and, and holes in our understanding that we have yet to figure out. So... Ah, yes, this is Ptolemy's map, right? You know, it's hard to understand also how powerful Ptolemy was. I mean, think about uh, melding together like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Einstein into one person or something like that. He, he was just, uh, he held unbelievable sway, right, in, this, in the scientific community and in the culture of the day. And his ideas uh, were picked up later by the Christian church, which came to be essentially synonymous with the state in early Europe, uh, early... Uh, modern Europe. And so the ideas were picked up by the church, and that made it very, very difficult to move them. Um, the church had its own agenda for why they wanted Earth at the center of the universe, but it worked out for them. So I don't know. There, there's, there's a real lesson here. Uh, I, I, don't know that the, I don't know that the textbook uh, or that, that most science courses are capable of picking up on the really important part of this story, which is that really brilliant, really famous people are wildly wrong sometimes. And they're really convincing, and their mathematics is perfect. So it's like, it's just, you know, I, I really think that human beings have this need to hold on to certainty about things, right? We look to scientists as if they should tell us exactly how things work, because somebody has to know, right? Right? But 
the truth is that we're all in this discipline because we're curious how things work, and not necessarily because we're going to ever be certain about how things work. Now, we might have better ideas than we did 200 years ago, 200 years from now, but this idea that science is going to give us some certainty about these phenomena is, is something we have to be really careful of. And I think it's definitely playing out today. And, and as we get deeper into this course, especially next semester, I think we're going to encounter a lot of these, these sort of epicyclic addendums, right? Where people are tacking on little pieces to save their failing theory. And, and those theories are still very popular and they're very predictive. So something to think about. Now, along those lines, I'm going to tell you another story about two gentlemen who realized the flaw in this way of thinking, uh, this, this Earth at the center of the universe way of thinking. And there are two very different approaches to getting a paradigm shifted. So what's a paradigm? I don't, I don't mean to be pedantic, but does anybody know what a paradigm is? It's sort of like, it's sort of like what you know without having to be told, right? So, you know, maybe somebody told you when you were a kid that the, the Earth went around the sun at some point. So I guess that's not a totally fair definition. But it kind of goes without saying, a paradigm, right? It is just the, the intellectual and knowledge base in which you operate. So periodically, those change, right? We, periodically, we learn things, and we have to rewrite our foundational ideas about how the world works. And we've seen this happen with, with germ theory is a really tragic example of this. You know, there's this dude who was working at a hospital. He's a doctor. I forget when this was, but it wasn't that long ago. And he, he said, you know, they had all of these, these women that were dying in childbirth. You know, dying in childbirth was pretty much your lot if you were a woman back before, you know, the, the understanding of microbiology, which was gosh, only 100, 150 years ago. So there's a lot of women dying in childbirth, and this one surgeon says, hey, guys, uh, let's just wash our hands before we deliver these babies. And they're like, no, man, that's absolutely ridiculous. Like, what are you talking about? And uh, he's like, no, 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 let's just try it. So, he, so whatever, a few of them begrudgingly try it, and what do you know? People stop dying. And uh, you would think, you would think that, you know, they would pin a medal on this guy, right? So he, he, that doesn't happen. And he, and he tries to go to some other hospitals around Europe and actually promote this idea. Hey, you guys should be washing your hands because look, when we tried that, uh, people weren't dying. And um, they said, uh, not only did they say he was crazy, uh, they actually drove this man out of medicine and he ended up, he, they ended up committing him to a mental institution and he died there. So, you know, this seems a bit extreme, but this wasn't that long ago. So, so I guess what I'm trying to work towards in the story of the two gentlemen I'm about to, to, to relate to you is that it's a very dangerous business changing paradigms, right? And, and you might ask yourself, why is that? You know, wouldn't, don't people just want to know what, how things work? Aren't people just interested in the truth? And, and this is something I haven't totally figured out myself yet, and, I, and it's something that I'm, I'm constantly struggling with because I certainly want to figure out the truth, but what you quickly find is that we're all just people, and you know, in addition to that nice intelligence ladder that we're climbing, these hierarchies and so forth, we're also, we're also deeply trying to improve our local circumstances, right? And so, you know, in today's climate, if you want to, uh, say, today's academic climate, if you want to do research on a topic, you need to get some money to do that. You have to have a lab to do it. And if you want to get a money for your lab, well, the easiest way to do that is to open up one of those government brochures that you can get on like the DOE or the, the Defense Department website or say the NIH website and they'll tell you all the topics that they're interested in funding essentially, right? Well, you can study this, that or the other thing and so you say, okay, I'll study this, you know, that's sort of in my wheelhouse. I did a bit of that in, in my graduate studies or whatever. And so, you, you do what's going to allow for you to have your career progress in that. It's, it's not a bad thing, right? You're just actually doing what the evolutionary conditions of your environment are forcing you to do. And the problem with that is that we're really good at studying the details of things that we already know in science, 
but it's very difficult for you to find a place in your career to study something that isn't known already. In fact, it's almost impossible, right? You can't go and ask the government to give you money for your lab for something that nobody's ever thought of before. You can at best use some money that they give you to work on something that people are already working on to spend a little bit of time working on something nobody's thought of. That's the best thing you can do, actually. And so, you know, say you do, anyways, so uh, that's my best guess for why it's so difficult to change paradigms is because people are, are essentially funneled into working on things that will sustain them. And uh, of course, people build up huge, illustrious careers. We give people Nobel Prizes for discoveries. And how do, you un how do you take someone's Nobel Prize away from them, right? How can you change your mind? I think actually, um, I'm just kind of going off on a rabbit hole here, but I think that Nobel Prizes are kind of a disaster for this reason, actually. Because once you start etching, you know, Stephen Hawking has an equation that is literally ground into stone on his tombstone. And it's a dubious equation. I, I can tell you some problems with that equation, actually. How do you undo things where, you, where you've actually monumentalized people and you've actually you, you've put your, your, your stake in the ground with respect to an idea when science has to be a, a, a discipline that ideas constantly change in, right? This is, this is uh, potentially something serious that we're going to have to figure out uh, a way around in the future. So needless to say, Let's say one of you guys, I don't know, maybe you guys are probably not going to become scientists. I understand most of you guys are, are in other majors, and that's cool. But it doesn't matter. Let's say whatever your discipline is, let's say maybe one or two of you are, are actually going to completely rock the universe in that discipline. You have some wild take on how to do things that no one's ever done before. It's going to be absolute hell for you to make that happen, is the truth of it. So the question is, there's two ways to go about it. And I encounter these two types of personalities all the time. And, and so these two characters, which we're going to talk about, uh, Copernicus and Galileo, were very different personalities. And they had very different ideas about how to pursue that paradigm shift. So they both realized the same truth. And actually, Galileo was a little bit later. So he knew about Copernicus's ideas. But they both went about bringing those paradigms into the mainstream conception in very different ways. And as we'll see, it worked out better for one of them than the other. So Copernicus was kind of interesting. Um, he's the guy that we see up on the screen right now. So Copernicus was born to a wealthy fam family. He was literate. He was well-connected. He was mathematically adept. And he had all the tools that you would expect for someone to need in order to make his idea come to light in the real world, right? Now, you might think, well, why didn't he just write it up and send it off uh, to, to all of his colleagues and just kind of call it a day, and maybe everybody would believe it. In other words, he had a mathematical rendition whereby he could explain how the heavens seem to operate if the sun was at the center. But he didn't do that. He kept that, he wrote that manuscript very early in his life, and then he worked as a prof professional, right? He, he worked in politics a bit. He was a physician. And he carried this manuscript around in his pocket with him. And he would only share it with his close friends. And periodically, he would change his mind a little bit about things, and he would retool some of the phrases and so forth. And he didn't end up actually, uh, so right around the end of his life, the printing press was invented. We'll talk about that in a second. But he was able to self-publish, essentially print this thing. And he didn't do it until he was almost dead. Right? And you might think, why, why, would he have, why would he have done that? Well, I, th I think the story of Galileo it, it will show us exactly why he did that. But the printing press, the days before the printing press are hard to imagine a little bit, right? If you have an idea, it's sort of like imagining, you guys, I would assume almost all of you, uh, maybe not all of you, but almost all of you ha have grown up with the internet, right? So. I was very lucky to have experienced the world before the internet for a minute, but it was a very different experience. And I think that the same experience was true before the invention of the printing press, because knowledge was essentially transmitted through only a few channels when I was a kid, right? You could go to a library, or you could watch TV, or you could listen to the radio. But there was only a few radio stations, there's only a few TV channels, and the library only had a few books. And maybe you could request a few more books, but you have to sit around and wait for them. And it's just this unbelievably tedious experience of trying to understand how things work. 
And, and, and if you're an author who, or you have a new idea, well, you better be able to network sufficiently to get your ideas onto those TV channels or onto the radio or into a book in a library or in a bookstore, right? So as soon as the printing press was invented, uh, this was an equivalent transformation for society, right? You didn't have to you know, have a friend who was a king to get your idea spoken to a lot of people. You could all of a sudden write a book about it and print it and give it out to people or write pamphlets or something, right? And actually, the revolutionary history uh, of our own country has a lot to do with this pamphlet printing business and, and disseminating knowledge very easily and cheaply. Well, I don't know how cheap it was, but it, it was you know, cheaper than running around telling people one by one, let's say. So Copernicus self-published this book. And... Uh, it's, it made its way around in different circles, and it actually made its way uh, at some point to this guy. This is Galileo. Now, Galileo was a very different personality type, right? He was a, a, a brilliant experimenter, so he was already quite well known for uh, all sorts of experimentation with the laws of motion and, and so forth. Um, and he gave us actually some of our foundational ideas about acceleration, which you, if you take a, well, you won't, but if you took an intro physics class, you would probably reproduce some of his early experiments. So the thing with Galileo was he was a bit more truculent, right? He, he, was a, he was a bit more of a joker. And he had come into uh, Copernicus's idea about the solar system. He thought it was a good idea, actually. And he realized very quickly that, that uh, the church was not very happy about this idea. So what did he do? He wrote a play. And in the play... It's called a dialogue between, concerning two chief world, dialogue concerning two world systems, something like that. He wrote a play, and in the play, there's a conversation between this brilliant astronomer and this sort of dunce priest, uh, which is modeled off of the Pope at, at the time. And uh, he called the dunce priest uh, Simplicus, actually, which is rather insulting. Now, it turns out Simplicus was actually a, a philosopher, but the, the Pope didn't, didn't like this very much. I, I would say that's an understatement. The Pope was furious about this book, actually, because you know, it kind of made the Pope look like a little bit of an imbecile. So this is how Galileo chose to publish his idea. He chose to do it by sort of making fun of the authorities of the day. This would be, you know, this would be sort of like in the world today, if I tried to introduce my new theory of gravity by making fun of Einstein, right? How well do you think that would go over, right? So, what did they do with Galileo? What happened? What became of him? Did they, did they publish his book and give him a medal? They threw him in prison. Yeah. Nice yeah, they made sure no one would ever read his book, first of all. So, it, it was banned, first of all. And then they, uh, they locked him up, right? They locked him in his, in his house. He wasn't able to go outside ever again. <laughs> okay, so that's a bit extreme, but is it really? I mean, in today's day and age, like, can you really put any idea that you have out on the internet? I mean, you can. Yeah. Can you? I run a YouTube channel, right? This is like, in some sense, how I make my livelihood. You can't say anything you want on the internet, okay? And especially when it comes, I'm sorry? You can, but like they, they, there's ways that you, you, you're, look, if you promote an idea that's not popular, let's say, it could be a scientific idea, especially, and particularly, maybe they won't throw you off the internet, but they're going to make sure people don't watch your video, okay? So this is a thing that happens today, actually. And, and there's ways around that. It's not a completely desperate situation. The way around it is something more like Copernicus, right? It's something more like being very careful, like having your ideas vetted by people that you very much respect, accepting critiques, sitting on those ideas, not being obsessed with making a scene of it, not being obsessed with that fame aspect in the short term, and actually being concerned with making sure that the idea is clear, concise, and able to be understood by people who pick up your book after you're dead, right? Or later, let's say. So, you know... This is a bit of a story of social politics, and, and who would have thought that that even matters in science, right? Science is supposed to be a subjective pursuit. I mean, at least that's probably what you learned in high school or something. But the fact of the matter is that there's no place where it matters more 
right? There's no place where politics are more important. What I mean by politics is your ability to get along with people, right? Your ability to make, uh, to make, uh, what's the word? Um, what, what's the word for a, a group of people? A, a com, uh, in Congress, they do this, right? There's uh, somebody help me. Like a, a, a quorum or something like that. You need to be able to basically make alliances with people, right? This is how you get ideas forward in science. So, you know, I have, a, I, I have had the wonderful occasion of speaking with a number of brilliant scientists. I have this podcast so I can just call up these people who have done incredible work. And the thing that shows up to me over and over again is that the people that succeed in that world and really get their ideas out there, and I talk to a lot of people who haven't succeeded too, who have brilliant ideas. The people who have succeeded are really good at making friends with people and really good at making their ideas useful to the people that they're friends with, right? They're not doing the Galileo thing of kicking the authority structure. They're doing the thing of, hey, I think my idea could actually be useful to you in your own discipline, right? There's something really, really important about this, guys. You know, and, I, and I think that if you learn anything in this course, we're going to see this keep cropping up over and over again. We're a social species, right? Everything we do, including our objective study of nature, which is what we hope science is, is deeply social. And so our understandings can suffer if we behave antisocially in any way. And so, you know, that's at the heart of, the, of this story uh, of Galileo and Copernicus. And, and we'll let that go for now, but it, it's something to really think about as we move forward. So Galileo also championed the telescope. He didn't invent it himself. Um, I think I have a picture of it here. Yeah, there's this telescope. So it's actually a Dutch invention, I believe. Um, nobody, you know, people had, the, the Dutch were very uh, well known for being able to make these eyeglasses, spectacles. So people had been making eyeglasses for a while, but no one had ever thought to put two of them together in a line so that they could magnify things at a great distance, you know. And uh, so one Dutch company came up with that idea, and Galileo decided to point it at the sky. And uh, that was a real revolution, because as soon as he did that, I think that Galileo was actually able to make uh, a very good argument um, to, I don't want to say proof, because proof is really a logical mathematical word, but he was able to deeply substantiate the heliocentric idea. Uh, and the way he was able to do that uh, was this. The phases of Venus. So have you guys ever seen Venus in the sky before? Pretty cool. It's, it's basically the brightest star. It's not a star, technically. but. The line between star and planet is a real mess. We can talk about that later. Uh, but it's the brightest thing in the sky, right? And so, the night sky, you know. Um, now, the hypothesis of the day was, well, if Venus is actually going around the sun, then we should be able to see phases like with the moon, because people understood the moon was going around the Earth. Now, if that was so, we should be able to see these phases. Now, you can't really see the phases with your naked eye. Some people claim that they can, but I, I, I doubt it. Now, as soon as Galileo turned his telescope to the sky, however, he was able to see these phases. And I think this was the really damning thing. And I think the church was really, really backpedaling at this point and quite nervous. And so they had reason to hate this guy, and he gave them even more reason to hate them because they had to change their mind about this. And, you know, whenever a giant institution has to change its mind about something, it's really bad press. It's, it actually makes a lot of sense, though, too, right? You don't want your, your, your state to be changing its mind all the time. It's kind of like that would be a really chaotic environment if every five minutes the state was telling you that a reality was very different than, than yesterday. So it's hard to fault them for, for wanting to maintain the status quo. All right, so we have a couple of other gentlemen to talk about. Also, these, these two are very different uh, personality types. It's quite interesting to look at them. So, you know, people began to really start to think about what it was that governed the motion of these bodies. So, yeah, anyways, Galileo, bit of a fail in his lifetime, bit of a success in certain ways, but people, especially with the phases of Venus, began to accept that, okay, Guys, I don't think we can keep on with this business about the Earth being at the center of, of the universe. It just doesn't seem to make any sense anymore. So the next question was, what is it exactly that is uh, governing the motion of these bodies? Why are they moving the way they're moving? And so naturally, the first step in answering that kind of a question is 
to try to come up with some patterns to that motion. And that's what these two gentlemen that we're going to talk about next were, you know, on a team to figure out, let's say. So on the right here, we have uh, Johannes Kepler. And on the left, we have Tycho Brahe. Now, these are very, very different people. So Kepler was was, you know, not born into a wealthy family. He was actually born into abject poverty, but he was a very brilliant kid. And he realized that he could make some money by teaching other kids, especially rich kids, how to pass their exams and so forth. And so he made himself something of a traveling tutor. And, uh, you know, he was one of those people that was just, uh, that wasn't enough for him, right? And so he spent a lot of his time contemplating this problem of what are the patterns of, this, of this, these bodies in the sky. And can we explain, ultimately, that's our hope, which we still haven't entirely succeeded at. Can we explain why they go around the sun the way they do? Now, he realized at the time there was this very famous playboy named Tycho. And Tycho, you know, he had a number of uh, hobbies and so forth. He, was, uh, he, was, uh, well, he had inherited an extraordinary amount of wealth. He was something of a baron. And, you know, his, his favorite, oh, excuse me, his favorite activity was drinking, but his second favorite activity was to stare at the stars with his friends. And he'd made actually an incredible star catalog. It was actually one of the most accurate star catalogs of the day. And so he was able to sort of uh, compile this literature, and everybody knew about it. And, and in fact, Kepler knew about it. And so Kepler went on a pilgrimage. He said, I'm going to go see this guy. I want to be able to study his star catalog because I think that I can pull out some mathematical patterns from this data. And so he did. And, uh, you know, he, he showed up at, at Tycho's house, and Tycho Tycho was essentially so drunk that he couldn't even really talk. He didn't have the ability to even interact with this, this Kepler gentleman for quite a while. So, but Kepler camped out. He hung out there for a number of days. And eventually, you know, he, he, he made uh, himself useful, which is a very good thing to do when you're dealing with difficult people. He made himself useful around the house. And, and he found himself actually able to get a look at this, this star catalog. And he began tearing into it and trying to come up with patterns. You know, and, and Tycho was a really belligerent, difficult dude to work with. He actually, he actually had lost his duel, or sorry, he lost his nose in a duel when he was a teenager, over, uh, actually over a mathematical dispute, which is really funny. You don't see that happening much these days. So he had a golden nose that was stuck on his face, which is just a really incredible image to imagine for this <coughs> sort of drunken astronomer baron, you know? It's just really something. Okay. Anyways, Kepler gets to work. And Kepler, uh, very quickly, he, he had been studying the, the geom basic geometry. And he had this relatively small insight, which turned out to be monumental, which was that, hey, what if they're not circles? You know, people were trying to fit these, these orbits to circles for the longest time, and they couldn't do it. That was, uh, you know, maybe I glossed over this, and I, sh I should have put this up front. The reason it was so difficult to ascribe an actual mechanical system to this new heliocentric model was because the perfect circles didn't seem to work out, right? Everything, the orbits would not align as they were expected to each year. It would be a little bit off when you tried to fit these bodies to circles. So... Kepler had the insight that, hey, what if instead of circles, that they're actually ellipses? Now, what's an ellipse? Well, it's something like an imperfect circle, right? It's stretched a little bit. And in fact, you can create an ellipse by taking a section of a cone like this. And that's probably how you came across it in geometry, right? So, <clears throat> so he started thinking about orbits in this, in this fashion. And of course, orbits are just the path of one body around another. Now, we have to understand a couple of things uh, about ellipses. We describe them a bit differently than circles, but not really, okay? So the, the major, uh, let's say, the, the semi-major uh, axis is actually the radius from the center to the longest point of the circle. And for all intensive purposes, this is essentially the average orbital radius of a planet, okay? It's very close to that because these orbits aren't, are almost circles. That's the thing that was so 
frustrating to these early astronomers is that they really did seem to be like circles, but not quite. And the fact is that they're slightly elliptical. And so Kepler started looking at, at the math of these things, and, and he based his math on this idea of the semi-major axis, which is this long radius, let's say. Now, it turns out that actually each of us, uh, each of our orbits, right, the Earth, Mars, the Moon, everybody has a little bit of eccentricity in their orbit. And you can see that eccentricity is just this word that we use to describe how unperfect the circle is. So, you know, if it was zero, no eccentricity, it would be a perfect circle. If it was one, it would be a parabola, essentially, right? It's an unclosed circle at that point because it's so elliptical. But these are some different bodies in our solar system. Um, there's a couple of them you can see that are pretty preposterous, right? Really eccentric. Does anybody have any idea what those things are? Comets. Yeah, they're comets, exactly. So the comets are very strange, and they have these really long periods, some of them. This is actually some of the reason why we think that there is this Oort cloud thing beyond the edges of the planets, right? far beyond, because it's kind of a harbor for comets that occasionally get displaced and kicked inwards, and that's why we have these comets that are that don't show up. And the, some of them that are on these really elliptical orbits only show up every, you know, some of them are on millions of years or hundreds of thousands, maybe thousands of years, uh, often at least hundreds of years, the orbits of these comets. Okay, so let's look at a little bit of, of the, the calculus that he did here. Now, Kepler realized one other really interesting thing, that the planets, when they were close to the sun, that is, when they were uh, at, you know, so he, he came up with this idea that not only was there an ellipse, but that the sun was not at the center of that ellipse, right? It was at some focus of the ellipse that was separate from the center of the ellipse. And that when the planets went around that ellipse, they actually went a little bit faster when they were closer to the sun, right? So he got all of this, by the way, from Tycho's data. So Tycho had just collected all of these star catalogs, and Kepler turned out to be something of a human calculator who was able to tabulate all of these things and actually make the lines in this data and come up with these relationships and able to pull out realizations like, hey, I think the planets are going a little faster when they're closest, right? I mean, these tiny little insights, and it's not much faster, by the way. It's a little bit faster. And so what, what Kepler realized, and this is kind of this brilliant leap of mathematical reasoning, is that what was happening in these orbits, this pattern, could be typified in that the area which is swept out by their orbit at any given time, which is this, this uh, you know, yellow stuff, it was the same area, right? It was the same area. But in order to cover that same area, it had to go faster over here, right? And this kind of makes sense when we start thinking about gravity as pole, which Newton gets us to later. But it makes sense that you're kind of pulled into the sun and you're going really fast. And then, oh, as you go away, you're kind of being pulled back to the sun, so you slow down, right? So there's, there's a little bit more meaning to be uh, extracted there. But needless to say, he came up with this relationship. So you can kind of see this in this animation. Ooh, it speeds up, slows down. Speeds up, slows down. And so the fundamental law of motion which he proposed, which is foundational for essentially how we understand orbits today, and it will lead us, you know, hopefully we'll get to it today, <clears throat> but if not, it'll lead us to Newton's idea, which we, of course, use for all of our NASA projects, um, was this idea that the period of this, uh, the period, which is how long it takes to go around an orbit, right, was in some sense proportional to that semi-major axis. And there's a, there's a mathematical relationship. So the period squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. Now, <clears throat> that proportionality sign is a really, really cool sign in mathematics. If you, if you learn one thing about mathematics in this course, that's something to remember because proportionality is sort of the first generalization that you make when you see a pattern in nature. It's like these things seem to be related, but they're a little bit different at the same time. Like you can look at like a broccoli and be like, Eh, it kind of looks like a tree, but not quite like a tree. It's like a little smaller or something, right? <clears throat> or like a bonsai tree. It's like it's a little tree, but it's not quite the same as a, as a redwood or something. So proportionality means we haven't figured out how to scale these things yet, right? The scaling seems to be different between these orbits, but they all seem to follow this pattern in general. 
<clears throat> so that really teed up the problem for, for the next champion who came along, which is, of course, Newton. And, uh, you know, Kepler didn't know what that scaling component was. He, he didn't understand what it was that changed these orbits, but still left them proportional in this very specific way. And Newton, you know, really nailed it. And he nailed it with his concept of mass. And that concept of mass is, is a real tricky one, right? And, and we'll, we'll work our way to that. So, but Newton was already famous, right? So Newton, Newton had kind of worked his, this was the crowning, Newton's laws on gravitation were kind of his crowning achievement. But he'd, he'd come up with a number of other things ahead of that, which kind of led him to be in the right place to address that scaling factor that Kepler had teed up for him. So Newton recognized that, that bodies seemed to have this tendency to stay in motion once they were in motion, unless they were acted on by some other sort of impetus, right? He, uh, he also set up these concepts of momentum, which is sort of a precursor to the idea of energy. It's like the amount of material and how much motion it has in it, right? And, and we'll play with the concept of energy a bit later in this course. But needless to say, energy it really doesn't have any rational basis other than some sort of material in motion. Or if it's potential energy, it has the potential for a material to be in motion. And then he came up with this idea of force, too. And force is just a wonderfully useful idea for engineering and it's absolutely disastrous idea for mechanistic understanding of nature. Because all of a sudden, by introducing the force, right? By the way, anybody seen Star Wars? <laughs> like how magical does a force sound, right? But all of a sudden, you know, Newton was so successful in terms of being able to predict the actions of, of different mechanical systems that the force became the de facto actor in physics presentations after this, right? The force is a noun all of a sudden, and it's a noun that's an actor, right? Just like in the past, maybe the planet itself would have to be an actor, right? Only these like surface-bound materials, right? Real material objects would have been the actors in physics before this. But all of a sudden, this idea became a physical actor, the force, right? Now, that's very, very useful for building stuff and for, for planning space shuttle missions. But it, it turns out, as we'll see later in this course, <clears throat> it's a bit of a disaster because it allows you to sort of shrug the problem of what's actually causing it. And, you know, when Newton finally, in his great work, proposed this theory of gravity, which was essentially a, a scaled version of Kepler's motion, he said, he, he actually went back after he published the book, it was wildly successful, you know, like, sort of like Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time or something, just this huge smash hit, right? But after he published it, he went back and he added an addendum to the end of it. And in this addendum, he essentially said, hey, 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 I don't know what causes gravity. I have no idea what causes gravity. I just said how it works. I just said the pattern that it takes, and I calculated gravity, right? And I think that uh, it was too late. The cat was out of the bag. And so most people, you know, I think uh, if you take this course anywhere else other than in this classroom with me, you'll probably... Most people will tell you that, that Newton uh, explained gravity, right? He absolutely did not explain gravity, and neither did Einstein, right? They've calculated them very precisely. This is very different than an explanation, and this is something that we're going to continue to struggle with in this course, because the worst thing that could happen is that we think we understand how things work when we don't, right? We have a lot of information. We have more information than we did yesterday, but we still have a lot of work to do. And I think that's, that's really, really important especially for, for young people. You know, maybe you guys won't become scientists, but maybe you have a friend who will, and you can uh, pepper them with some of these ideas. All right, so Newton came up with these uh, laws of motion. Uh, the first law of motion was something like we, we spoke of already, that the, the body that's moving kind of tends to stay moving, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we'll look at how these were mathematized in a second. So there's a, a more symbolic way of expressing each one of these. Um, the second law, that the amount of force that you put into changing the motion of somebody uh, is, it is essentially proportional to how much change it will experience. Fair enough, right? And then 
the, uh, the third law was that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. This is really interesting in terms of, of, of actually balancing systems. And we'll look at how this actually sets up the solar system. And we were talking about why it is that the planets, you know, stay in this, these nice lanes, right? Why is everybody staying in their lane? And it's like, well, there's a serious balance between the different forces that, are, that they're experiencing, right? They're each being tugged and pulled by one another and the sun, and they're each flying at these speeds, and there's a perfect balance. And you might say, it seems preposterous that the balance would be just perfect. Because I'm telling you, if this Earth starts going a few kilometers, I, don't, I actually don't know what the calculation is. Somebody's done it, though. I'll try to figure it out for you guys. If the Earth started moving a little bit faster in its radial velocity, it will fly off the leash, right? So all of these planets are perfectly balanced. And you might say, how is that possible? And, and the answer is, there's a lot of selection, right? I mean, how is it that we're all sitting here in this auditorium? Well, there's a lot of, a lot of experiments in life that didn't work out. And I suspect there's a lot of planets out there that didn't work out. And actually, in fact, there's been some incredible uh, findings lately about planets that they're finding that aren't part of solar systems now. You know. There's, uh, there's pairs of planets, actually. They found something like 40 of them this last week in the Orion Nebula that are just orbiting one another, these Jupiter-sized planets. They don't have a star. It's preposterous. And like, the, the scientists are just like, what is going on? How is this possible, right? And I think in some sense, like, it's because we have to rethink where planets come from. And in some sense, we have to rethink how stable this whole situation is that we're a part of right now, which is a deeply uncomfortable thing to sit and wrestle with, right? Anyways. All right, so let me see if I can at least bring us up to uh, Newton's, law, Newton's law of gravitation before we close out. Um, these are, of course, just the mathematization of Lu Newton's first laws and second laws. The F equals MA is the one that you're most familiar with. That, that's Newton's second law. It's written in calculus here. Has anybody taken calculus before? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. I mean, calculus is useful. It's very pretty looking. Um, where this essentially just says that the, the change of the momentum, which is P over here, with respect to the change in time, is equal to the force, right? So it's just a little bit different way of saying that the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. These were not necessarily unknown ideas at the time, but Newton formalized them into this, this sort of language that was easy to behold and for people to manipulate in years going forward. And furthermore, he introduced this idea of a force, right, which was super convenient. It was super convenient. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's not uh, the most scientific explanation for things. Okay, so I don't have time for that. Uh, all right, let's just, let's end with mass. So, you know, Newton had the realization that, um, he had the realization that he could actually make sense of Kepler's laws if the, the, the pro constant of proportionality, that which actually changed the equation between one, solar, uh, one orbital path, let's say Mars and Earth, was the amount of material that was present, right? He, he had this revelation that, that mass, the, the amount of matter that was there, was actually what scaled the equations. And... Um, you know, this concept of mass, you know, maybe I'll pick up there again because it's just too big of a concept for me to just jam into a few minutes right now. The concept of mass is a real mess actually today because you might think if I asked you, you know, you're not scientists and I say, hey, what does mass mean? Like, let me ask you, somebody tell me, what does mass mean? Eh? Weight, quantity, quantity of what? A quantity of atoms, that's brilliant. It is actually the quantity of atoms, but most people might tell you, uh, it's the quantity uh, of stuff or something like that. But, you know, and this, there's reason to believe that because people will put masses on things like electrons and protons and things that are actually composing atoms, right? But unfortunately, it's not quite so simple. It's not like they're actually taking a scale down there and measuring the gravity of an electron. So let's pause here for today with the concept of mass. I want you guys to think about what mass means how the heck it is that people think they know the mass of an electron, and if that word is, is maybe due for an update. And we'll, we'll start there next time. Anyways, thank you guys for coming. If you came to the coffee thing, let's do it again. Come next week if you didn't come this week. And uh, have a wonderful weekend.